Wow. I've been sitting out there uh, watching this event tonight, and I'm just amazed that uh, I should start off by saying my name is Mark Lee Shannon. I'm a person in long-term recovery from substance use disorder and mental health issues, and I was sober eight years last Thursday. And it's not lost on me, it's not lost on me where I was eight years and five days ago. You see, because if you'd have told me that I would be standing here tonight talking to you guys at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with my band about ready to play rec songs off a record that I made, two records I've made, three records I've made, I would have bet against you. And if you're out there watching or listening in a treatment center, I want to tell you that if people like me can recover, there's hope for you too. And I'll tell you a little bit about my story. So I grew up in, uh, in a Catholic neighborhood, pretty, pretty normal neighborhood, but um, my family's house was that house that everybody kind of went, what's going on over there? You know, Christmas lights are in July, lawn getting mowed kind of, let's put it unevenly. And it seemed like we were different because we were. We were very different. But that's not why I'm a person in long-term recovery from substance use disorder. When I was growing up, my childhood was not the childhood that I wished it would be. But again, that's not the reason I'm a person in long-term recovery from substance use disorder. You see, I believe that each of us out there has a bio footprint. For example, I'm a type two diabetic. My grandfather was not. I'm an alcoholic. My father was not. He was a diabetic. My grandfather was not. Why is that? I've got a picture of myself as a 10 year old kid playing baseball, West Akron Baseball League, wobble had the cool hat, and if you played in my day, you had it angled just the right way. I think you know what I'm talking about. But I see in that kid's face a lot of, a lot of fear. But if you'd have told that kid that the guy standing next to him in that picture, every time he got stung by a bee, he went into shock. But me, I just went home crying. Why is that? I believe it's because some of us have a bio footprint that leads us to have a propensity towards substance use disorder. And then, if you do, like me, and you behave yourself into it, you have a, what I believe is a medical condition. I believe that what I suffer from with substance use disorder as an alcoholic, alcohol use disorder, is like any other disease. The organ affected by me is my brain. You might be able to tell from my haircut, but I know, it's late. But I know that every disease has four qualities to it. Number one, it's primary. I'm not an alcoholic because I'm a diabetic. I'm not an alcoholic because I might have been in a car accident one time. I'm an alcoholic because I have a bio footprint towards it and I behaved myself. I did a good job of that with constant and continued use of substances for over 30 years. The second reason I believe that my disorder is a disease is that it's chronic. That means without treatment, for those of you out there in treatment centers, without treatment, it won't get better.
it does not improve. You see, I used to always try to use the I pronouns. I'm going to fix this. I just won't drink at that bar because they, they pour too heavy. I won't hang out with those people because they're the problem. She makes me angry, so I drink. See, none of that really was my truth. It was on me. The third thing I believe about my disorder is that it's progressive. Take a look up here. Three times in the ICU. Three times. And each one of those times I said to myself, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to be okay. I'll just drink that light liquor, you know, because that dark liquor make you crazy. I'll try the marijuana therapy because that'll help me mellow it on down. But it didn't work, you see, because that's not the way the disease works. How many of us would tell a cancer patient, come on, man, just quit that cancer. Don't you see what you're doing to your family? Can't you see what you're doing to your loved ones? Come on, man. Now, that makes about as much sense as trying to tell someone that's in the depths of substance use disorder, come on, man. Don't you see what you're doing to your family? Don't you see what you're doing to yourself? Don't you see what you've done to the, your job? And the final thing I understand about my disease is that like every single disease, it is fatal. Take another look up here. I mean it. Three times. Three times in the ICU. The last time was November 13th. And I can still remember looking up to the wall and there was one of those insipid sayings on the, on the blackboard like, just for today. That didn't mean anything to me when I was sick. Any more than it means to somebody to say, hey, just get a gym membership, brother. You're going to be all right. What I needed and what all you needed out there, which I will tell you that if you're in a treatment center, you're in the right place. Because you're not, and listen carefully to me, this was the paradigm shift for me and my understanding of how to become well. I wasn't a bad person. I was a person with a substance use disorder and a mental health issue, and I needed treatment. There was no way I was going to get better with using I, me, and my pronouns. The three hardest words for me to say in my recover were, listen carefully, please help me. I wouldn't do it. See, because I grew up not needing anyone else. I grew up thinking I'm going to do all right with it. But it made about as much sense as buying a gym membership and walking in and sitting on the bench and watching everybody work out. And I'm telling the people out there in, that are watching in treatment centers, if you want to recover, you have to be willing now, let me tell you a little quick story here before I go and start playing music with this incredible band here. And set my stuff up, too, because I got to do that. There was this guy who had a car. And that car kept stopping all the time. You know, all his friends said, man, why don't you get that car fixed? Don't you see? And his family and his loved ones all said, man, dad, your car doesn't work. Can you get it fixed? In his job, he was always late. His wife was not happy with him. And everyone in his life knew that he needed to get his car fixed. Now, I may be using an analogy, but that car was like my life. And if you believe in and follow a 12-step program, you'll know that the first step is what? You admitted you were powerless. So one day this guy is driving down the road, and it's an Ohio road, typical in the summer. He's got the orange barrels. And he's in a single file line. Guess what happens to his car? That car decides to stop. Now the flag man's waving at him, and his people are calling, and his kids are calling him on the phone, and he's looking down at the McDonald's bag in his front seat going, those french fries are still good. 
I'm joking again. A little humor doesn't hurt. Woo. I know we're getting tired, don't we? And he finally says to himself, I've got to get this car fixed. And the next thing he hears after that is he hears the knock on the door. And it's his buddy. And his buddy says, man, roll the window down, roll the window down. He goes, what's happening? He goes, man, my car is broke. I can't get my car fixed. I don't know. I should have got it fixed. I should have listened to everybody. Now it's time. I'm going to get myself. I'm going to get my car fixed. Step one. Admitted that he was powerless over fixing his car. And his buddy says, brother, you are in luck today. Because I know a guy just a block away. And that guy, a block away, has got one of those cool little places in the back of his garage. He's got all the tools. He works on cars, man. He can fix your car. And he says, there's a guy. There's a guy that can fix my car. Came to believe there's a power greater than you that can fix your car. So he looks down at that McDonald's bag again, eyeing those French fries, thinking, they don't look all right. Whew. And he turns to his friend. He says, brother man, let's push my car. Let's push my car and get it fixed. He turned his life over to a power that was greater than him to fix his car. And on June 2nd of 2014, I entered St. Thomas Hospital. Detox. Oh, I got to wear the uniform. Didn't know which side was with him. But this way, do I button it that way? Which way do I button it? It didn't matter because the phenobarbital, which they gave me because they asked me, have you been drinking a lot? I said, no, man, I don't drink that much. You know, because, you know, we all tell the truth when we're in active addiction, right? After the first day, I was able to get out of my bed. Second day, I was able to not, I'll be very kind. I could control my bodily functions. And the third day, I started going to meetings. After about the fifth day in that detox ward, I remember staying up late at night and there was a conversation I was having with someone and they said to me, Mark, you know what, what you said really helped me. And I went back to my little room in that detox ward and sat on my bed and I heard a voice. Now, I don't know if it was my higher power, my higher self, my conscience. It might have been the phenobarbital. But it said to me, you never got sober because you never did anything to help anybody else. You changed that. And you're going to be all right. You see, you may think that I'm here to help you tonight, but you're all here to help me. It's in that peer-to-peer -peer support where we all join together to help each other, that is the power of recovery. And if you're out there and you're watching in a treatment center, take a look at the person next to you. The person that maybe helped you order food earlier today. The person that maybe gave you a tissue during a meeting. The person that maybe you gave a hug to. That's what I'm talking about. We all stay sober together. There's no lone wolves in recovery. We all have to help each other. And I want to leave you with one thing. My life in recovery is like this pencil. And thank you, Kimina, for finding this pencil. I appreciate it. Pencil's a very useful tool. Something has to happen to it, though, before it can be used. Who knows what that is? You have to sharpen it. Now, if I'm a pencil and I got to put it into a sharpener, there's some metal blades going on there, right? Now, if I'm a pencil and I can feel, that's probably pretty uncomfortable for me. But if you're out there listening to me in a treatment center, I want to tell you this. There is no other way to get the pencil sharp except to put it into the sharpener and go through that first period of discomfort so you can have a point on it. The second way my life is like a pencil in recovery is on the other end, there's an eraser. I can look at my mistakes and then realize their lessons in life. 
They're no longer mistakes to me, they're lessons. The third way that my pencil is like my life in recovery is once it is sharpened, I can write things down, we can talk, I can make a move, I can write a book, I can do different things. You can leave a mark in your community. And the fourth and final way in my life is like a pencil. Is it's what's inside that matters. The willingness to get yourself into a treatment center. That's the first step. Without that willingness, you cannot recover. Thank you for having me tonight.